I have to ask you Mechila because I got engrossed in something else, a matter that's very engrossing. So I just simply forgot to look at the time. We started a new section of Madrigal Sodom, but I would like to digress today, an exception, and talk to you because today is the yard side of our, of our Baron Cutler. And I had the privilege of learning in Lakewood and a special privilege of being close with him of all the people around, perhaps one of the closest, if not the closest. Part of it had to do with the fact that my father worked in Slobodka and was very close with him all the years. And when I came to Lakewood Hanukkah time, so the Rosh Hashiva greeted me. I had met the Rosh Hashiva on other occasions when I was younger. But the Rosh Hashiva said to me the first thing was, I remember when your father came to Slobodka. My father was maybe a year younger than him. Something like that. So I always like to tell this story because it really illustrates his asana. One of the Rosh Hashanahs that I was in Yeshiva, I was there many, for many, the many years I was there, I was there Rosh Hashanah. So on one Rosh Hashanah, I said to him, there was a, by the Suda. So I said to the Rosh I sat, I was there to sit by his table. And I was there to sit opposite him. Face to face, three feet away. And I said to him, uh, it says, uh, the minute is not to sleep on Rosh Hashanah. Because we don't know the moment of din. And a person shouldn't be asleep at the moment of din. You may have heard this from me. So I said, I know the moment of din. That's the way I put it. In a very challenging manner. I said, I know the moment of din. So she was said to me, when is the moment of din, since, supposedly since you know it? I said, the moment of din is very easy, I said. It's at Mitzoy Rosh Hashanah, 18 hours, when the sun is 18 hours east of Yerushalayim, that is the end of the din. And it's very easy to figure out, right, the longitude where you are in the world, exactly what time the din is at that time. Because that's the only time that the din the only time that the whole world has Rosh Hashanah at the same time. Because after that, the sun has gone further and the day is over as, as, the, as the world revol- revolves. And I'm explaining it to you more than I had to say it to him. And him I just said, this, the only moment where there's a din on the whole world. And the Gemara says, they're all judged with one glance simultaneously. So that means the whole world is judged in one moment. So there's only one moment that the whole world has Rosh Hashanah. So it's very easy to figure out when Rosh Hashanah is over, according to those opinions that it's 18 hours, which is the majority of opinions. 18 hours east. So Shiva smiled. And then when I tell this story, I always say that this Hanoi that he had from the question is a question that gave him a pleasure. And the smile that he had when he heard it gives me pleasure. Marayim. She said, you're making a mistake. 
You don't understand what it means, kulum skor muskir achas. You all judged at one moment. Then he said a pshat. The pshat he said was that when a person is judged, but this is not in his original, it says this in other places. If a person is judged, let's say he has to have an einish. So it's not just an einish for him, but the family suffers with the einish also. If the family didn't deserve the einish, let's say a, a, a person's injured. So the parents suffer from the injury. Sometimes the siblings suffer from the injury. They have a lot of sorrow from it that one of the members of the family is hurt, that this particular child is hurt. So in order for the child to be hurt, he had to do an aver of some kind. But in order for the parents to be hurt, they also had to do some kind of aver that deserves that hurt. Because a person doesn't hurt somebody unless there's a reason. It doesn't hurt a person emotionally unless there's a reason. If the mommy's going to feel bad about it, and when she will, so she deserves to feel bad. So the person is judged, and at the same time he's judged that he's supposed to get a, a pain, so everybody around him is judged. And they have to get a pain. And the people around them are judged. Let's say an uncle or an aunt, that they get a certain amount of minor pain because it's their sister's child or their sister is suffering because of the child. So they also are suffering. So you also have to deserve the pain. And if any one of them doesn't deserve the pain, the pain won't happen to the child. You all have to deserve the pain. That's what I'm Paul like that's a bunch of mish, but it's perfect. She says, so everybody in larger circles is affected by what happens to each individual until the whole world is really encompassed. And beside that, he said, the judgment goes if he deserves to get a pain. But there's a question, why does he deserve it? His father or his mother trained him a certain way. So maybe it's not fully his pain, his. his. No, it's not fully his punishment. And his grandparents trained the father. The great-grandparents trained the grandparents. And they served as an influence. And there's another chajim. If he has a pain, what kind of effect will it have on him? And what kind of effect will it have on his children that are yet to be born? And what kind of effect will it have on the grandchildren? Subtle effects, no question, but nevertheless an effect. In effects that are so subtle it can't be defined, perhaps can't be seen, but they have an effect. So Hashiva says, you see that the din on each individual encompasses the whole world, and the whole bria mibreshes asev koladoris, is loshen, mibreshes asev koladoris. So that's what it means, that when a person is judged, it doesn't mean everybody's judged at the same moment. But the gabi, this individual is getting judged, the whole world is judged. And why do I tell you the story? I told you for you to understand that the Rashiva understood the world, the whole mass of the world. He understood the implications of something in its universal sense. He understood that in his time, 65 Bachram, later on it became about 104, if I remember. 65 Bachram or 100 Bachram in the United States of America, where they were at that time 5 million Jews, there still are 5 million Jews because the rest already stopped being Jewish. He understood that 100 Bachram, and he had at that time when I came to Lake was 65, 70 Bachram, smaller than Yeshiva for Rockaway. He understood the impact that 100, that 65 Bachram was going to have on on their families and the world and the whole Jewish people. And in fact, in one of the times he spoke to us, the Rechizuk 
So he, in fact, he said, that during the days of Sefer Shreftim, it says that Gimei went to fight the battle against the Goyim. And in order to fight the battle, he had to have soldiers who had not knelt, had not kneeled, maybe, or knelt, I'm not sure the right word, kneeled, probably, to Abed So he took his troops down to drink water, and some of the soldiers went down on their knees because they were used to going down on their knees, drinking water. There were others who went who did not go down on their knees because they never went to a Vedasar on their knees. And they just didn't want to go down on their knees. So they got a hold of the water, they lay out on the ground flat, and they and they took the water that way without going on their knees. They didn't let their knees go down on the floor. There were 300 of them out of time, if I remember correctly, 10,000. And those 300 became the soldiers. So the 300 people, 300 young men, army men, who had not bowed to the idol bow, out of the whole Jewish people. And the Roshiva said, and from these 300, they rebuilt Claudius Road. Two generations later, they built the base of Nebush. So 300 people can rebuild Claudius Rome and take a look at what, not only what Lakewood has become, but what Lakewood has built throughout the United States and Israel. You know, the largest competing yeshiva of Lakewood is the Mir Yeshiva Mishalayim. Wonderful place. A wonderful place. I have a brother in law who's a couple years younger than me, married to two sisters. His name is Avram Shmulevitz. His father was Abraham Shmulevitz, famous for Yeshiva of the Mir. Rav Shmulevitz remembers very clearly he came in at time in Shiva I think 2 o'clock or something like that, 2.15. He had to go out in the street in Yerushalayim and ask Jews to come in to make a minion for Mencha. There was no minion in Shiva. Did you hear that? There was nobody there. Brilliant Reb Chaim Shmulevitz said a shir. And you know how many Bachim were in it? Two. There were two Bachim in a shir. Two Bachim. And look at the mirror now. And where do those boys come from? They come from America. Oh, they come from England, from other places too, of course. Now that you have a volume coming from America, so of course you're going to have others. Why do they come from America? Because of Ravon's impact on America. Because the impact of the handful of Talmudim that he had, that they had on America, through him. And that's why there's a very shimmerish line. And because his Mary Shiva and Shlam is another Shiva that didn't exist or brisk, it wasn't the Yeshiva. He had two or three Talmudim. So we're by its impact. So Eretz is throughout the Torah, throughout the world, and the Yiddishkeit throughout the world. It's so strong. It came from him. The Hasidic world grew from him. When I was young, there were very few Hasidim in the world. They, were, they come from Hasidic background, Hasidic, but they didn't turn out to be Hasidim. And they went to the yeshivas, and my Chaverim, 
you know, turned out to be Hasidic Rebbe, said, I'm going to tell him to just book him in Yeshiva, regular book him. And he became Rebbe's. And the children became Rebbe's. And they became Rebbe's because of Rabbanon's impact on them. They went back to the authenticity of their Obar. That's all of his credit, all of it. And he never looked for credit. But he had a view of what he's doing. As he, he understood the gigantic impact a small thing has. One of the important things he said was that Bakr make a big mistake. I think I should share this with you. Bakr make a mistake. He thinks like this. Well, I made a scene on this Masechta. I learned so many blood this year, but here. It's not the year we learned, but it's 30 blood. I learned it very well. Next year, another 30 blood. There's another Masechta. A year later, I'll learn another 30 blood. He sees every year as just a repetition of the present year. And that's not true. Because what happens with Torah is Torah just multiplies. It explodes. It's not that you learn 30 blot this year and 30 blot next year. 30 blot next year is 30 blot is a different kind of 30 blot than this year. Your knowledge, your head, your information you're carrying around is a different thing. It's like having 300 blot next year. Whether you actually cover 300 or not. And a year later, it's not 300 blot. It became 3,000. And a year later, it becomes 30,000 or 300,000. And that what the Bukha doesn't understand. And having heard that from him, they look at Lakewood, which they don't understand what they're looking at when they're in Lakewood, because they weren't there in the beginning like I was. I look at Lakewood and I say, look, he started with, who knows? I think he started originally with 13 Bukha, I think so, maybe 14. By the time I came, by the time I started, came it was 65. By the time I came, maybe it was 70. I don't know. Well, I never counted them at that time. Maybe 70, maybe 80. A few years after I came, I know they counted, somebody counted it was 104. Counted the beds. Look at Lakewood, can you believe it? Have you been there? Gigantic. And that's all from one man. Just like he said, you can't measure the impact just by looking and thinking it goes further. It just explodes. And in individual life, your knowledge of Torah and your tzidkis, everything that you have in yourself, explodes. And you don't realize it. A person is like a seed. When the seed grows a whole tree. Have you ever seen an apple seed? A little piece is about this big. A whole tree grows with apples hanging. Each one of them has a dozen seeds. One little seed it grows. Did you ever eat a popcorn? You ever see the kernel? A little kernel like this. It exploded. It explodes into fire, just exploded into a different shape. Popcorn. Pop. That's what happens to a person. And the fire that you expose the popcorn to is, of course, the fire of Torah. I like called the Varika Eish no mission. It looks like a fire. Eish does, you know. 
fiery law is given from the Baruch Hu's right hand. Fire. Expose things to fire, they melt, they change, they can be shaped, they can be formed, they explode. And that's the story of a barn. There were other Gedolim at the time, there were. My wife's grandfather was from the Gedolim at the door. From the Afton. Special Jew, Mishnah Sever. Great man. But he didn't do it. And I think what was missing was this. By all of them. I don't think that they had a saga. That this can explode to something gigantic. And have the world view. Gigantic change that will take place. I think that's the most important thing to have. To realize that when you are doing something, it's not just you're doing it now. You're having a profound impact. Your children will be different. Your grandchildren will be different. Sometimes an older person, children say, you know, he has 140 descendants, Rosh Hashanah. It's true, it's happened by a lot of people. My puppy had so much and so much, so old Shem Hashanahs. Old Shem Hashanahs, and they're having, each one is having, is married with a family of six kids. And the next generation is, is larger still. That's what's happening. That is small because the physical world doesn't multiply to such a great extent as the Ruchi sticker world. In Yeshiva, they told the story. And I never saw this happen. And I was able to drive to Yeshiva a number of times remember how many, but quite a number of times to New York. It was a cycle. Those who the drivers. So it was like a, a Gabba in Yeshiva who said, This time you're going. I was on them. I didn't put myself on there, but foolishly I didn't put myself on there, but they put me on. Tried to get off because I didn't want to wait, waste the time. Waste the time, you understand? Driving to Yeshiva, I wanted to stay with my Gemara. So I said to the Gabbai, who came to tell me it was my turn to drive, I told the Gabbai, I just got my license, you know, I'm not a good driver, it's not safe. He said, I know you. He said, you just got your license, but you're a safe driver anyway. So the story was told, but I never saw it. In those days, there was no easy pass. But there were, in my time, they installed automatic lanes where as you pass, you threw change into the, into a, a kind of a, a half circle bucket and it counted, it went through a machine and counted it. Before my, before that, it was by each, by each lane of the exit, there was a person. Then they put in these automatic machines and automatic machines they put in. There always was one lane where there was a person. Because you had, the, people didn't have the correct change and had to get change. So one lane had a person. So they told the yeshiva that the yeshiva was, was, was being driven. And he said to somebody, I'm sure the story was true because it's so typical of him. If the story is typical of a person, then you know it's true. That's the kind of thing you can, if you knew him, that's the way he would be. So he said, when they were approaching the toll booths, 
He said to his driver, go by the man. Pay the toll there then. So the driver said he's got the change. Whatever it was, 50 cents, two quarters, just throw it in. He said, no, go by the man. And the man, you should know, was a slower way of getting through. Was there were other people needed change? The guy would come with a dollar bill, need a change. You know, it took time from the car after car to go by the man. So, you know why you should go by the man? Is it because the man sees that a machine is doing this job and he's denigrated? It's a bazillion for him that a machine can do the job of a human being. And he's, what, what is he? He's just, he's just something, just a substitute for a machine. Has to know that he's chosh, we need to have him. Who's this man? He was a relative. He was a Batamachim. He was a Yid. He was just another human being. A boy. She treated everybody with such respect. With me, I don't remember it even happening once. And I'll tell you, I know why it didn't happen. It was a new Rashiv. It happened to be that Rashiv at that time was driving with somebody and told him to do it. But usually when you were driving your Shashiva, he was thinking and learning. He was so into learning that he didn't know where he was holding. He didn't see it. You could see in his eyes when he was thinking and learning. Like his eyes would go to the side and then back to the middle as he thought about things. And whenever he was was free, he was thinking and learning. And I used to watch him sometimes when he was at a a meeting with other people sitting with them. And they would drush us. This one would speak, this one would speak. The Rashiva also spoke, of course. The other speeches, they, you know, there weren't much to listen to, except they were long. And you look at the Rashiva's face, you saw his eyes, you knew he was thinking and learning. He wasn't wasting his time. He couldn't hold the safer in his hand. He would have had such a mind, he didn't need a safer to think and learning. But we in Yeshiva knew he used to think and learn. And Bokram Yeshiva, he'd be sitting by lunch and they'd be, you could see they were quiet and they were thinking and learning. And sometimes they told you, Sha Sha, I'm thinking and learning. He carried the Torah with him all the whole times when he carried it safer or not. He usually carried it safer in my time. He carried a mission brewery usually. I went some with I was once traveled with him and had a morale with him. He was a sham, I remember. I was a little surprised. He was a Rangaton and learning. And that is of key importance. That's what we saw, and that's of key importance. If you push yourself past a certain level, so learning was very easy. You have to push past it. But learning becomes very easy. It happens by itself.
know, she had not been feeling well. And we heard about it. By the door, the base managed to us nail, and on the nail was a small sh- piece of paper from a small notebook, like a uh, place six inches by four inches, something like that. A small loose leaf notebook, always. And it had the Mar McClaimers the next year hanging there. It was Shir and Shabbos. Or Shabbos night during the winter, eight o'clock. We share Monday morning. And the Mara McClaimers, he was going to talk about, were on that paper. And the sure had been posted. In the paper, there was a little nail sticking out next to the door on the door post. The side toward the inside of the base marriage. And whoever had the Mara McClemmis who had taken the had been dictated to them by the Rashiva, would take that sheet of paper and roll it down on. And he pushed it over the top of the nail and let it hang from the nail. And when the Rashiva started to shear, so somebody would take it down. List on the bottom of the page would say the shear would be at this in this time. She is kind of my soy shabbos. A she is kind of beyond bays. And the shear just hung there, the Mara McClemens. The shear didn't say the shear, which is very shocking. And it hung there, and hung there, and hung there. Day after day. And then we heard he was in the hospital. And there was some who were, who were getting phone calls about her. She was conditioned. Further, she would have had a surgery, a big surgery, and somebody picked up the phone, and his remark about the surgery was, "We hope it will be good." It was after the surgery. We hope it will be good. Very upset whenever that you hope it will be good. It sounds like, despite the surgery, there's something else to worry about beyond the surgery. Very upsetting. Very upset. And then. He started saying to him around the clock. Pretty much. I remember we said to him, till late at night, I don't remember, maybe 12 o'clock at night or something. And I was newly married. I was married a year. And we were told, you know, okay, go home. And I went home, got to bed. About two or three in the morning, my phone rang. I got a call and come back to Yeshiva. It's a very bad massive. And I got up with an hour or two of sleep. And I walked back through the night to the Yeshiva. maybe a block or two away. 
was two o'clock in the morning. A block or two away, I heard the cry, the quail, the tillum in the night, in the quiet night, quiet streets, you could hear a block away. I came to base Medrash. The room was crying his heart out. And up on the bima, I think it was three steps only the bima. The room was open. And a whole bunch of bachrim, I don't remember a number, standing with their heads inside the room Kredish. Together with everybody else, they're standing in base Medrash and dominating and crying and saying, Tilm Pusik by Pusik. These guys were standing up with the heads of the Oren Kredish, crying their hearts out. It wasn't enough to cry in front of the Oren Kredish. Open the Oren Kredish and stuck their heads in. Wow, they're British away. Save our Rebbe. We said to him maybe for two hours and a phone call rang in the hall again. And things took a turn for the better. And we took, went home again, took a nap, came back for chakras. We opened your own Kredish. I don't remember what they opened during Kredish. I do not remember if they opened during Kredish before Kriya Satyar to take out the Torah. It was Thursday morning where they finished the and then took Oren Yodin Kredish a second time. I don't remember that. I just remember the opening during Kredish. And he started to say, Tillin. I remember Avram Siegel was leading the Tillin, Pussy by Pussy. The other was responding after him, busting by busting. And I remember the Shmuel Klein came in. The phone had rung in the hall. <laughs> Shmuel Klein came in the door of the base medrash. He walked down the aisle that was next to the door, near the door. And it was a roll of Bochum on one side, a roll of Bochum on the other side. And as he walked, he turned his head to the right, to the Bochum, and to the left. And he said, Borch Tain Lemes, to each row. And Well, it rose up as each girl heard it. But in a moment or two, it was in my mind, impressed that Avram Siegel was standing by the home in the front and he didn't know what was going on. Because the guys who were saying to him were saying so loud, it was such a cry, that he didn't know the difference between those who were crying that he should be saved and those who were crying because it was God. And the word spread around the base Medrash. And gradually, all those who were saying to him, stop, it's not the cry. And Abraham Siegel was saying, Bussing by Bussing. And somebody went over to him and tapped him on the shoulder. And he stopped. And the elf was crying his heart out. He sat down on the floor, on the dirty floor, in fact. Everybody took off his shoes. They were moaning and groaning. There was a guy who used to sweep the floor and he came into the Smedrich. He came into the yeshiva. 
in the front hall, guys were sitting in the basement, guys were sitting, and everybody was on the floor. And he looked, and somebody said to him, you didn't speak good English tonight. Somebody said, boss is dead. An expression on his face, and he just left his broom and walked out. Boss is dead. It was so hard. It was so hard for clients resolutions, not just us. And after Levi in Brooklyn, Manhattan, he put his bar in into the hearse, I guess it was. The crowds, such crowds you can't believe, 50,000 years and maybe more. They reached forward to touch the hearse. To touch him. Station requires her with boss of that man. Man who shaped the generation and future generations, who shaped all of us who are listening today, and thousands more who aren't listening. And my friend who had been with him in the hospital before he died, because he took shifts in the hospital, told me that the Revison came and she sat next to the bed and she was in terrible shape when she saw what he was going through. And he said to her, and my friend heard it and told me, I deserve it all, he said in Yiddish. Is Kunt Meralz. I deserve it all, he said to her. Comforting her, of course. Because you know he's not getting what he doesn't deserve. I deserve it all because I didn't accomplish enough. Rabbi Sai. He didn't accomplish enough. And what do you say about the kid that has a good head and could be a good of Israel? He turns out just to be another schnook. What about his accomplishments? It never happened. So of course, there are many of you that are thinking, listen, I don't have the talents and the brilliance and the brains. I'm sorry to tell you, Rabbi Sai, I'm an old man. I've seen many things in my life. And I've seen tremendous things accomplished for Torah, for Yiddishkeit, for Amisro, by people who pure Asian were very untalented at all. Very untalented. Just ordinary, very ordinary kids. <clears throat> As Ramon said, the biggest mistake you make is today I do this. And then later on it will be like that. And you don't know that it will explode. The 
explodes like popcorn. When it's exposed, when it's exposed to the fire of terror. Look what happened that the best friend of the Jewish people that has ever been in the White House was primarily not supported by the Jewish people. And the people, other people who supported his opponents were people who hate Jews. Not only they say so, they say so, but they write in their constitutions. And the secular Jews who have no Torah are with them. I is not good for you, it's not good for your people. No, we hold like this and this and this. How did that happen? The majority of secular Jews support somebody who's not good for Jews. When Giuliani ran for mayor, Italians all voted for him. When Dinkins, the African American, ran for mayor, the blacks all voted for him. Why don't you vote for somebody who's good for you? You know why? Because Jews need something to make them smart. How smart we are is one thing that we don't have. We can never think straight. We can never think straight. We can never think straight unless we have Torah in us. We can never think straight unless we have Torah in us and all these Jews have no Torah. We can never think straight. That's a new, a unique trait of the Jewish people. We can never think straight unless we have children. We don't think straight without Torah. And just like Torah makes us think straight, our boy sign. The same reason it makes us think straight, and Torah you didn't think straighter than non Torah you. And such basic things as your own welfare. So Torah does a lot of other things to you also. Torah says, Shem to Mima, Machimas Pesi. Her is perfect. It makes even a fool smart. Machima is pesi. Makes a fool smart. The person who doesn't learn that term and understand that remains a pesi. He gave us life, and no doubt, as a shomer, is tied to the source of all life. Schusi again, Elena. We talk about it, which should be for us a schus, and should protect all of us. Thank you for listening.